All right, we're in the old city of Jerusalem. This is an upper room. It's not the exact room where Jesus and his apostles came together for the Lord's Supper, but it would have been something like this in an upper room. On the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Where do you want us to make preparations for you to eat the Passover? He replied, Go into the city to a certain man and tell him, The teacher says, My appointed time is near, and I am going to celebrate the Passover with my disciples at your house. So the disciples did as Jesus had directed them and prepared the Passover. When evening came, Jesus was reclining at the table with the twelve. And while they were eating, Jesus took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup and gave thanks, and offered it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day, when I drink it anew in my Father's kingdom. When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. It was required of Jews, and of course Jesus was a Jew, under the law of Moses to celebrate the Passover feast every year to remember the Exodus. The festival commemorated the final plague of the ten. This one is to commemorate that tenth plague in Egypt. The firstborn Egyptian would die, while at the same time the Israelites' firstborn would live, would be spared. How would that child, that Israelite child, be spared? Well, Scripture tells us that every family or society, didn't have to be specifically, as I understand every family, was to kill a lamb. Now, this child, this lamb was to be approximately one year old, without blemish. So each family, each society would offer this one lamb, this animal, together. They were to smear then the blood of the lamb on the doorpost as a sign of their faith, their trust in God. That they believed God and they believed His Word. And as the death angel would come through, the death angel then would pass over that home and the child would not die. Thus, it celebrates the Israelites' liberation from Egyptian slavery. Keep that in mind. It was to commemorate, to celebrate, to be reminded, to be reminded to be reminded of their liberation from slavery. Now, we would say Egyptian slavery. But the key to keep in mind, they would be set free from slavery. So, to commemorate, God instituted the Passover. It was to be observed on the evening of the 15th day of the first month of the Jewish year, Nisa. It was to last... Seven days started on the 15th day of Nisa in the last seven days. In Judaism, a day commences at dusk and lasts until the following dusk. In fact, we, we were there for a Sabbath in Jerusalem. Well, Friday evening at dusk starts the Sabbath for the Jewish people. So at dusk on Friday evening, all the shops closed. All the Jewish shops closed immediately. I mean, they shut up. Most of them put a sign on their door that said, close for the Sabbath, the Sabbath. And from that, the dusk on Friday evening until dusk on Saturday evening, all the shops were closed. As soon as the sun set on Saturday evening, immediately the shops started opening around. And that's thus the idea of the dust, the days being counted. They, of course, didn't have clocks and set time like we do. And to know midnight brings a new day in. How do they know when midnight for most of them? So the setting of the sun, dusk, would create a new day for them from day to day to day. Thus, the first day of the Passover only begins after dusk of the 14th of Nisan. 
after dusk and ends at the dusk of the 15th Nisan has begun. Now, it lasts for seven days then after it has started. The feast was meant to be an annual testimony to God's deliverance again of the children of Israel out of their bondage to the Egyptians, their slavery. So get the image, get the picture from Moses on. From Moses on, from the plagues on, from the tenth plague on, the Jews celebrate the Passover in the same way. You've probably heard it called the Seder. The Seder. The word Seder just means order in Hebrew. So from now, from, for some 3,500 years, the Seder, the order in reference to the Sabbath, or, or in, of, in reference to the Passover, excuse me, in reference to the Passover has been basically the same with little, some changes, but very little changes overall. Now, several elements of the Passover I want us to consider, three of them, in fact. We're not going to consider everything about the Seder today, just three specific items within the Seder or the Passover I want us to consider this morning. The first is the unleavened bread. Every year at the Passover, the Jewish people were to have unleavened bread. Well, what does that mean? Of course, bread without yeast. Bread without yeast. Two parts of the Passover in reference to the yeast. On the 13th day of Nisan, the people were to come into their home and literally do a major house cleaning. They were to go through the house and make absolutely sure that no, not any yeast was allowed to remain in the house for the next seven days during the Passover. So they would come do a major sweep through the house to remove all yeast. That's the first part of the unleavened bread concept. The second part is that they would make bread, of course, without yeast. Unleavened. Unleavened. Initially, it symbolized the Israelites had no time to put leaven in the bread and allow it to rise before they had to get out of Egypt. You remember Pharaoh made the, declare, the declaration that they could leave. And they immediately began to pack up, started getting out of Egypt, headed toward the promised land. You'll remember as well, Pharaoh changed his mind and started chasing after them. So they didn't have time to allow the bread to to rise so it was unleavened they had to make because of their hasty department from Egypt. Thus, why this festival is also called the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So it was during the Seder, during the Passover celebration, year after year after year, that unleavened bread would be served to everyone. It had a couple of purposes, but I want you to get that in mind. This unleavened bread would be served during the Passover remembrance, celebration. That's the unleavened bread. Next, the juice. The juice of the fruit of the vine. Wine. Four times in the Passover remembrance, celebration, the Seder, four times wine is served, even till today, four times. Each relates to the promise Promises literally found in Exodus chapter 6, verses 6 through 7. Now, that would tell us it's before that Pharaoh had actually set them free. God made four promises in this passage to the Israelite people. They can be summed up. God promised his people he would bring them out of Egypt. He would bring them out. He promised that he would free them from being slaves. He would bring them out, free them from being slaves, the third cup that would be served is the promise that he would redeem them unto himself. Redemption. Redeem them. The fourth promise, he would take them to be his people once again. Take them back to be his people. The key is of the four promises, remember that third one especially. He would redeem them. So during the celebration of the Passover, four different cups would be served and those at the Seder would drink them. They knew that the third one represented the promise that God would redeem them out of their slavery in Egypt unto himself. The third element I want you to consider then is the lamb. We have unleavened bread, we have wine, juice of the vine, 
and we have a lamb. A lamb was selected on the 10th day of Nisan. 10th day. Ponder that this week. We're going to come back to that next Sunday. On the 10th day of Nisan, the lamb was selected. Now, it was not uh, killed, sacrificed until the 14th, but it was supposed to be selected on the 10th day of Nisan. Sacrificed then on the afternoon of the 14th day of Nisan. When the temple then was built, when the temple was built, the killing of these lambs took place in the temple of Jerusalem. First in the tabernacle, then in the temple. Now, for this lamb, not the, the, those who were to sacrifice the lamb were to be very careful that no bone was broken. And the, bone, and the blood had to be caught by a priest and taken and sprinkled the blood of this lamb sprinkled upon the altar. Then the family or the society that was offering this lamb, it would be sacrificed, the blood caught, the blood taken and offered or sprinkled on the altar. And then the lamb, get this, the lamb was given back to the family for them to take the lamb home. And on the 15th night of that evening of Nisan, they were to roast the lamb and to have a meal as part of their Seder, part of their celebration. They would eat the lamb. Also, Scripture says that any portion that was not eaten during that 15th evening, before morning of the next day, they were to burn it up. Literally burn it to be ashes so that nothing would be left of the lamb. So we have leaven that was to be unleavened bread. We have the juice, the wine, four different cups. The third cup, the cup of redemption, unleavened wine. And then we have a lamb that was to be offered. The blood caught, put upon the altar. The, blood, the lamb then partaken by the people. Now, that brings me back to the passage that I read in Jerusalem. I was right outside what they think would be similar to the upper room that Jesus had his apostles to go secure for them to remember and to celebrate the Passover together. Hopefully, okay, hopefully you got a little bit of a taste of what that room would have potentially looked like. You can't know for sure, but potentially it would have looked like something like that room with the arches upstairs, an upper room. It was very roomy. A lot of people, of course, uh, go into that room and go out of that room. A lot of groups come into that room and they sing. It's a very uh, heart, passionate, emotional place to go visit. Just because you know within probably... I don't know, a hundred yards potentially, that the actual upper room would have been. If this is not it, it would have been very nearby, most likely. So you get a feel and an understanding of what it must have been like when Jesus is going to celebrate the Passover together with his followers, and he had them to go to an upper room and to secure it today. And during that Passover time, he institutes what we call his supper, the Lord's Supper, during the Passover time. So that Matthew chapter 26, verses 17 through 27, speak of that reality. Jesus is going to meet with his apostles in this upper room to celebrate the Passover. Just so you know, know this, just so you know this, it is argued by scholars, those who really study the reality of Scripture to the very depth of its possibility. It is argued by them whether Jesus is really on that night in that upper room really celebrating the Passover with his apostles. Why would they say that? Well, Matthew, Mark, and Luke seem to imply that he was. John implies that he wasn't. If the dates are right, he was a day early in celebrating the Passover. Actually celebrating. He would have been in that upper room on the 13th day of Nisan. You are to 
sacrifice the lamb on the 14th on the afternoon and then start the celebration officially on the 15th. He would have been a day early. John implies that that's reality. The others do not. For me, it's not a big deal. I'm comfortable with it. The Lord knows. He's Jesus, the Son of God. If he wanted to do it a day early, hey, he's all right with that. What we do know, or I'm all right with that, what we do know, the elements for the Passover celebration would have clearly been in the room. Everything they needed. It was the day of preparation. So everything they needed would have been there in the room. It would have been in the context of that room. It would have been there. The reality is then, they would have come in and cleaned the room. No yeast can be there. So in your mind, see the apostles getting there and cleaning the room. Every, every little pinch of yeast had to be removed. They would have baked unleavened bread for the Passover. So you can smell unleavened bread. They would have had the juice, they would have had the wine ready to be used for the Seder. And then there's the lamb. Let's come back to the lamb in a minute. Well, let's look at these three elements in reference to the Lord's Supper that he instituted that night. Think first of the unleavened bread. Unleavened bread. You remember initially it was to signify that they didn't have time to put Leaven yeast into the bread and allow it to rise before they could, had to get out of Egypt. Get out of Egypt. Get out of Egypt fast. Over time, leaven became to represent error, evil, sin. Leaven represents sin. In fact, in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 6-7, through 7, it implies that sin left unchecked will permeate and infect everything. It gets into everything. You understand, a little leaven in the bread impacts the whole loaf. Well, sin in our life, Paul speaks of in that 1 Corinthians, impacts our whole life. Jesus spoke of the reality of the Pharisees' leaven or their yeast that was impacting everything as well. That being true, note that Jesus says what he says as he gives them the bread. As he's instituting his, Lord, his supper, he gives them the bread and he says in essence to them, this is my unleavened bread, my unleavened body handed over for you. What was Jesus saying? He was saying, this is my pure, spotless, without stain. This is my sinless body given to you. We're going to come to the table in just a moment. And we are going, and I, the deacons are going to hand you a little piece of bread. It is unleavened. It has no yeast in it. When you hold that bread, it symbolically represents Jesus' perfect, spotless body. Given in reference and in place of your yeast-filled body. Do you get it? We are yeast-filled. We are sin-filled. We are leaven-filled. Jesus is saying, here is, apostles, my unleavened body, my sinless body given for you. Sinless. Scripture indicates that none of Jesus' bones were broken, did you hear me a little bit ago? The lamb sacrificed at the Passover. Bones were to be carefully not broken. But there is no doubt Jesus' physical body as he was being beaten, scourged, carrying that cross, nailed to that cross. No doubt his body, even though a bone was not broken, his physical body no doubt was broken. As the blood was pouring forth. Visualize that. But more significant than that for me is the spiritual reality of the brokenness of Jesus. His body broken by the presence of our sin that he took upon himself. Our sin. His unleavened taking our yeast upon him. Oh, that's why I think we can hear him say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The imagery there is God, in essence, turns his back as Jesus receives our yeast upon himself into his unleavened body. He took our sin. 
The bread thus symbolizes the sinless body of Jesus given for us to become sin for us. So I want us to come to the table and to partake of unleavened Jesus. Men who are going to serve, if you would step out and come forward, please. If you will go ahead and take the unleavened bread and pass it to each of the men, Gib and Ron, and pass it to each of them, and then I'll have Gib pray first, and then you'll be able to serve. Scripture indicates that Jesus blessed it and then gave it to them. I'm going to ask Gib to pray for this bread. Consider, you hold in your hand unleavened bread. Jesus said, take, eat, this is my unleavened body. Next, with these men, just stay right there just for a second, man. Let's consider the juice, the juice, the wine. We know if Jesus actually is doing the Passover that night, if he is doing it, it is probably the third cup right here. He comes to the third cup, and he speaks of that third cup and redemption. To redeem. You remember he told them with the third cup, the Israelite people, he would redeem them out of Egypt, redeem them out of slavery, Slavery to the Egyptians. It is this third cup that speaks of the redemption, the paying, the purchasing of us out of slavery to sin. Do you see it? The blood, the Jews symbolizes the powerful, precious blood of the Lamb, of Jesus Christ. Jesus is saying, my blood is in this cup will purchase a new agreement between you and God. Between God and humanity, he calls it the covenant, a new agreement. The Old Testament teaches whenever God brought reconciliation with humans, a price of blood had to be paid. That goes all the way to Adam and Eve and right through time. In fact, Hebrews 9.22 tells us, Without shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. There is no reconciliation without blood being shed. The cup represents the agreement or the deal between God and us purchased by the blood of Jesus. Jesus is saying his blood is sufficient. Think about it. Thousands for in that time over 1,500 years, thousands and thousands of lambs have been killed and their blood had been sprinkled on the altar year after year after year to fulfill the law. But none would fulfill totally the law. So they had to do it year after year after year. One lamb's blood was not enough. But Jesus' blood is enough. The cup represents the shedding of his blood for the forgiveness of sin. I like the imagery. Think about the Egyptian, I mean the Israelites in, in Egypt. They were to take the lamb's blood and smear it, smear it over the doorpost of their home, and the death angel would pass over. We are to take the symbolism of the blood of Jesus and smear it over our lives. And the death angel passes over. And life is brought. So let's partake of the juice. Men, if you will serve it, and then I'll have Ron pray before you deliver it.
Ron, if you will pray, please. And then he said, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sin, to redeem, to purchase, to buy. Men, you may be seated. Oh yeah, one other element. Where is the lamb? The lamb was to be sacrificed. The blood caught. The blood was to be sprinkled on the altar. Where is the lamb? Maybe, maybe what we should what should catch our attention most in reference to this upper room experience is that the lamb's not mentioned directly. Remember Isaac asking his father Abraham when. Abraham was taking Isaac to Mount Moriah, Jerusalem. Where is the ram? And Abraham says, God will provide. The apostles surely had mentioned it. We don't know whether they had one or not. It's not mentioned. They would have said something, surely. Now get this. Exodus 12, 10 says, The lamb is to be chosen on the 10th and sacrificed on the 14th and roasted and eaten on the night beginning the 15th day of Nisan. Get this, the lamb was to be sacrificed on the afternoon of the 14th between 3 and 5 o'clock our time. Where is the lamb? He's on Golgotha. That's where he is. Think about it. In the temple, they would have been running one lamb after another and slashing that lamb's throat, taking, catching the, the blood and going and sprinkling it as they had for thousands of years on the altar again, on the altar again, while at the same time, the lamb was giving his life on a cross. That's where the lamb is. That's why he could say, it is finished, it is done. His payment was complete payment. No more lambs needed to be sacrificed. His was complete. Jesus is on the hill called Golgotha. There giving his life. You remember, it was John the Baptist who declared that Jesus was the Lamb of God. In John 1, 29, the Apostle Peter spoke of Jesus as the Lamb without spot or defect. In 1 Peter 1, 19-21, in Revelation, John saw Jesus as a lamb looking as if he had been slain. In chapter 5, verse 6, where is the lamb? Look to Jesus. He is the sacrifice who paid for the Passover for us. So that the death, eternal death and damnation might be passed over us. Thus, the death of Christ marks the release from slavery of sin for all who apply the blood to the doorpost of their lives. 